All right, welcome back. Hope you're having a great week. Today we're continuing our Let's Learn ABA series with preference assessments. Preference assessments are crucial for both RBTs and BCBAs. We do them all the time. We take what the client may prefer, and then we see, hey, does this work as a reinforcer? So you need to know it both for the RBT exam, the BCBA exam, and the BCABA exam. If you're looking for RBT study materials, check out btexamreview.com, BCBA and BCABA. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Like and subscribe. We also have a YouTube membership now if you'd like to support us further. Other than that, let's work hard. Let's study hard. Let's learn ABA. So obviously, we're studying preference assessments today. They're just procedures determining what do people select given certain circumstances, right? Environmental conditions affect our preferences. We can establish hierarchies of preferences. And then when we have those hierarchies, we can then take those and determine, are they reinforcing? Are they going to work as motivators? The three types we're going to look at today are asking about stimulus preference assessment, free operant stimulus preference assessment, and then the most common type, trial-based step preference assessments. So how do we do a preference assessment? Well, it's, again, what a person chooses in certain situations, and we have to keep this in mind. If you work with a client in different environments, their preferences might change depending on where the environment is when services are being delivered. So how are we going to do it? Well, gather a large amount of stimuli. Any preference assessment should be preceded by gathering a sufficient amount of stimuli, especially with some of the populations we tend to work with, their preferences can be very narrow. You can never have enough potential preference stimuli. Then select the preference assessment you're going to use based on the client need. Present stimuli to persons as outlined by the assessment. Once you identify the assessments, start testing them out for reinforcing properties. Four is essential. Remember our rule. Just because it's preferred doesn't mean it's reinforcing. Again, our most common types of stimuli preference assessments are going to be trial-based and free operant. Single stimulus, pair stimulus, free operant, multiple stimulus with and without replacement. So let's start with asking about stimulus preferences. Probably the most inaccurate type, okay? We, the most indirect type, um, it can be misleading, it can be inaccurate, but it's quick, it's, it's efficient, and it's a good way to start sometimes stimulus preferences. If we already have an idea of what the client or the learner might like by asking, it might narrow down some of our choices that we use in our further preference assessments. So open-ended questions, right? We're not leading, no leading questions. Very open-ended, very casual conversation. Uh, specific questions like, what would you work for? What would you rather earn, cookies or toys? Remember, just because stimulus preferences don't necessarily establish something as a reinforcer, it doesn't mean we have to hide the reason we're doing it. Because in the end, we're using stimulus preferences as kind of a jumping board into reinforcers. So asking someone, hey, would you work for a can of Sprite versus would you work for a five-minute break, that can quickly lead you down the road to identifying what's going to motivate them and what is going to be reinforcing. And then have the person rank their items, right? Make a list and have them rank it. So you don't need to be sneaky about it. You don't need to be coy about it. Stimulus preferences are very out in the open, right? They're very obvious. So you can also ask significant others, parents, siblings, other stakeholders. But again, often inaccurate often misleading. We really want to do some more direct preference assessments. So you can do a free operant observation, which tends to be very hands-off, right? We're observing someone kind of in their natural scenario, right? It's unrestricted scenarios. And how are you going to do that is you're going to put them in these free operant situations and then go ahead and record the duration of how long a learner engages with an item. There are no response requirements, meaning they have just free reign to whatever is available. A lot of times it's less likely to evoke problem behavior. So if you have a new client where you have no rapport, or if you know your client tends to engage in a lot of problematic behaviors, maybe when things are denied, free operant might be a good way to go. Also very natural. It gives them a chance to just be themselves, right? There's no there's there's a lot less reactivity compared to other type of trial-based observations. So the two main types are contrived free operant, where you're actually setting up the environment putting certain items in place and letting the learner explore. Don't get confused. Even though it is contrived, the free operant observation doesn't mean there's response requirements. It doesn't mean you're manipulating anything, right? As it's going on. All you're manipulating is the items you put in the environment, 
Okay, you're still giving them the chance to freely move about. Now, naturalistic is the most unobtrusive because now we're just putting the learner in their environment, watching and recording. You're not even setting up the items a certain way, picking certain items. You're just letting them go unobstructed into their environment and recording what they're doing. Finally, trial-based methods, which are really the most common ones if you're an RBT. These are really what you're going to be doing, you know, session in and session out. So the first one is a single stimulus-based method, uh, also known as successive choice, single stimulus engagement preference method. A single stimulus is presented, the person's reaction engagement is recorded, and you do this until all items have been presented. You can present each item several times and then rank the items. Now, obviously, there's certain downsides. We're not actually comparing items together, right? Because we're just presenting them one at a time. You're also essentially making them choose each item, right? So it's not really a choice. It's a successive choice, right? Meaning you're showing one at a time and then creating kind of a hierarchy. A paired stimuli is a forced choice preference assessment, probably the most well-known. You present two items together and record which one is chosen. You want to present every stimuli together at least once. If you have five stimuli, you need to compare all five stimuli to every other stimuli. If you have 15, again, compare every other one. This is when sometimes those asking preference assessments can help you narrow this down. It's stronger than a single stimulus, and it's great, 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 actually the best at establishing a hierarchy because you're actually sitting there comparing all stimuli to one another. And then multiple stimulus with and without replacement, probably the most misunderstood, especially for behavior technicians. But just think about the wording, okay? Multiple stimulus. So we're dealing with three or more stimuli. When we have a single stimulus, we have one. When we have two stimuli, we have paired choice. When we have multiple stimulus, we have three or more, okay? Then we have with replacement and without. And with replacement is exactly what it sounds like, right? Whatever is chosen, you put it back in the array, and then the items that aren't chosen are replaced. So if I have five items, if item C is chosen, we put item C back in the array and we replace the other four. Multiple stimulus without is the opposite. Item chosen is removed from the array. If I have five items, item C is chosen, I take item C out, we have four items left. Think about the wording, right? Multiple stimulus with replacement, we are replacing the things that aren't chosen. Multiple stimulus without replacement, we're removing the one that was chosen. So finally, to sum it up, just because it is preferred does not make it reinforcing. You can combine multiple types of assessments, and you probably should. And you want to always, 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 always pick the assessment that works best for your client. That is preference assessments. We will do another video on reinforcer assessments later on to give you an idea of what that looks like. As always, questions, comments, please let us know. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.